Hello students, it's great to be back with you guys and uh, the last time we were together we did the inferior view of the skull or the norma basalis. So this was the norma basalis. Now what we are going to do is the interior of the base of the skull. So interior of the base of the skull is naturally divided into three fossae which are known as anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa. Once again, this is the anterior cranial fossa, this depression is the middle cranial fossa while this is the posterior cranial fossa. So today we are going to do the interior of the base of the skull. So this is very important and it is frequently asked in the examinations. There are important foramina here and uh, as I mentioned before, I am going to tell you uh, the details, anatomical details which are important and I am going to omit some details which I will deal with later uh, so that your comprehension is better and the teaching is relevant. So now we talk about the anterior cranial fossa. So the anterior cranial fossa is this. Okay. So now what are the boundaries that you should know. So anterior cranial fossa is bounded anteriorly by the frontal bone. So this is the frontal bone. So this is the anterior boundary of the anterior cranial fossa. Okay. While posteriorly the boundaries are posterior border of lesser wing of sphenoid bone. So this is posterior border of lesser wing of sphenoid bone. Anterior clenoid process. This here is the anterior clenoid process of either side. So posterior border of lesser wing of sphenoid bone, anterior clenoid process. And then we have the anterior margin of a sulcus here, which is known as sulcus chiasmaticus. So this is sulcus chiasmaticus. This is its anterior margin. So this is also forming the posterior board boundary of the anterior cranial fossa. So once again, students, I repeat, the posterior boundary of anterior cranial fossa is formed by three structures and they are the posterior border of lesser wing of sphenoid bone. This is the lesser wing of sphenoid bone, so its posterior border, the anterior clenoid process and the anterior margin of this sulcus which is known as sulcus chiasmaticus. Okay, now what are the structures that we identify in the anterior cranial fossa? So this here is the location of the orbital plates of frontal bone. The orbital plates of frontal bone, they separate the orbits from the anterior cranial fossa. So you have orbits here and they are being separated from the anterior cranial fossa by the frontal plate of orbital bone. Now in the center you have a sieve like area. Sieve or in Hindi what we call a chanini. Yes. So sieve. So this sieve like area has got many perforations. That is why it is called a sieve like area. This is the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone. So these perforations, they are students for the filaments of the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve is the first cranial nerve and it is the shortest cranial nerve. So there are many multiple openings here in the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone. And through these openings, 15 to 20 filaments of, of the ophthalmic nerve, they pass from nasal mucosa to the forebrain. And which part of forebrain? The olfactory bulbs. Okay. So olfactory bulbs, they are a part of forebrain and they are responsible for uh, perception and they are responsible for uh, perception of the smell, the olfactory stimulus. Yes. So uh, we have the orbital plates of frontal bone and in the center we have the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone with multiple openings. Okay, so now we see what other structure we find in relation to the anterior cranial fossa. We have done orbital plates of frontal bone and the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone. Here as I told you before is the lesser wing of sphenoid bone on either side. Okay, so lesser wing of sphenoid bone. The fourth structure is this crest which is seen in the midline. This is called the frontal crest. Okay. And the fifth important structure which you should at this point of time be able to identify is this tooth-like projection which is known as Krista Gelai. Okay, now this Krista Gelai is a triangular projection. Okay, and it's called uh, Krista Gelai 
uh, Gallus domesticus is the Latin name of uh, the cock. And this Crista galli has got the resemblance to the uh, the cock, uh, the comb of a uh, cock. So that is why it, it is called Crista galli because Gallus domesticus is the Gallus domesticus is the cock, the Latin name for cock. And this uh, Crista galli, it resembles the uh, comb of the uh, or the crown of the cock. Yes, so it's called Crista galli because Gallus domesticus is the Latin for the cock. Okay, so these are the important structures you need to identify in the anterior cranial fossa. Now we come to the middle cranial fossa. What are the boundaries of the middle cranial fossa? Well, the anterior boundaries are formed by the same structures which are forming the posterior boundary of anterior cranial fossa. So, they include the posterior border of lesser wing of sphenoid bone, anterior cranoid process and the anterior margin of sulcus chiasmaticus. So, what are the posterior boundaries then? Posterior boundaries of middle cranial fossa include this superior border of petrous part of temporal bone. This hard bone here in the center is petrous temporal bone. Okay. So, this has got a superior border which is grooved. So, this grooved superior border is forming the posterior boundary of middle cranial fossa. Okay. So, what else is forming the posterior boundary of middle cranial fossa? This here, students, is the uh, dorsum cellae. Dorsum cellae and on the sides of dorsum cellae are the posterior clinoid processes. So, dorsum cella, which is forming the back of the Turkish saddle. Okay. So, this dorsum cella, posterior clinoid process and superior border of petrous temporal bone. They in continuity, they form the posterior boundary of the middle cranial fossa. So, I will repeat. Superior border of petrous temporal bone this tuberculum cella and the margins of tuberculum cella, the lateral margins which are forming the posterior clinoid processes. In my specimen, they are a bit, uh, um, you know, uh, they are not so clearly visible because the bone is broken here, but otherwise the ends they are referred to as uh, the posterior clinoid processes, the ends of this bone which is the projection which is called the tuberculum cella. So, this is the middle cranial fossa and these are the boundaries of the middle cranial fossa. Now, what are the important structures one must appreciate in the middle cranial fossa? Well, once again, what you need to identify in the middle cranial fossa? So, first of all, there is this sulcus chiasmaticus. Okay. This sulcus chiasmaticus leads laterally into the optic canals. So, if I put the probe here in the optic canal, it comes out through the sulcus chiasmaticus lateral end of sulcus chiasmaticus. So, optic canal is opening into the lateral end of sulcus chiasmaticus. So, this sulcus chiasmaticus actually uh, it is related to optic chiasma posterior superiorly. Okay. So, optic canal is opening into the lateral aspect of the sulcus chiasmaticus. You can see the probe here. Okay. So, optic canal is opening into the lateral aspect of sulcus chiasmaticus. Optic canal transmits the optic nerve for vision, as you already know. Okay. So, then the third important structure which you see here is a ridge here, which is referred to as tuberculum cella. So, this ridge is tuberculum cella. And then we have this cella tarsica. Cella tarsica or the Turkish saddle. The lower end of which is hollowed out for the pituitary gland, what is referred to as the hypophysial fossa. And then we have the dorsum cella here. Okay. So, once again, which structures have we identified so far? We have identified the sulcus chiasmaticus, optic canals opening at its lateral end. We have identified tuberculum cella. We have identified cella tertica. We have identified the dorsum cella. Okay. And then here is the location of the carotid sulcus where lies the cavernous sinus. So, the cavernous sinus is lying here on either side of body of sphenoid bone in the carotid sulcus. Okay. So, this is the location of the carotid sulcus where the cavernous, cycus, cavernous sinus is lying. Then which other structure important we find here? The opening of the superior orbital fissure. You can see the probe now coming out from the 
superior orbital fissure it is opening here so the opening of the superior orbital fissure is lying here then students another important opening is the opening of the you can find here the maxillary nerve here which is the foramen rotundum this is a very important structure in the middle cranial fossa so the opening of the foramen rotundum this rounded foramen actually this is from where the maxillary nerve is being transmitted into the pterygopalatine fossa so uh, if i pass the probe through this foramen rotundum it should enter the pterygopalatine fossa so this foramen rotundum students we don't find in the norma basalis it's not visible from here so the maxillary nerve will enter the foramen rotundum which is this foramen okay and it will go into the pterygopalatine fossa now where is the pterygopalatine fossa located for that i'll take you to the uh, normal lateralis okay so in normal lateralis here is the pterygomaxillary fissure okay and if i put the probe here in the pterygomaxillary fissure now my probe is entering into the pterygopalatine fossa so that entry into the pterygopalatine fossa is through the foramen rotundum which can be appreciated here in the middle cranial fossa so once again where is the location of foramen rotundum this here is the location of foramen rotundum and this is the opening of superior orbital fissure so this rounded foramen is the foramen rotundum and it is from here that the maxillary nerve is leaving the cranial cavity to enter into the pterygopalatine fossa now the other important structures you see here is this oval foramen this is the foramen ovale which is lying posterior lateral so this is foramen rotundum and this is foramen ovale okay this foramen ovale is transmitting the mandibular nerve and still posterior to the foramen ovale is the foramen spinosum is the foramen spinosum so once again what important foramina we have studied here foramen rotundum foramen ovale and posterior lateral to that foramen spinosum so if you know these foramen students they are frequently asked in the examinations and you are asked to enumerate the structures first you have to identify these foramen and then you have to enumerate the structures passing through them then the other important thing here is this irregular foramen which is on lying in relation to the floor of the cavernous sinus this is called foramen lacerum foramen lacerum now the probe is in the foramen lacerum so once again this is foramen rotundum this is foramen ovale and still posterior to foramen ovale is foramen spinosum and here we find the foramen lacerum the lacerum means with irregular margins so this is a foramen with irregular margins lying on either side of body of sphenoid bone okay so this structure was the foramen lacerum then the other important thing here is i told you before this is called the petrous part of temporal bone rock like petrous part of temporal bone so now if you see here this anterior aspect has got a depression here and this depression is for the trigeminal ganglion i can also show you it to you from this side you can appreciate this depression is there okay and this depression is for the uh trigeminal ganglion so where is this depression located it is located in relation to the apex of petrous part of temporal bone okay so now my finger is in relation to this depression and this depression is for the trigeminal ganglion it is on the anterior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone near the apex so this is foramen lacerum and this is the impression for the trigeminal ganglion and this is foramen ovale and what lies posterior to for foramen ovale posterior lateral to it lies foramen spinosum okay and this was foramen rotundum right so you must be well versed with the location of these foramina rounded foramen is the foramen rotundum the oval foramen is foramen ovale the small foramen lying posterior lateral to foramen ovale is foramen spinosum and on either side of body of sphenoid bone the foramen with irregular margins is the foramen lacerum so this is so important that i am going to repeat again so this is foramen 
rotundum right students this is foramen ovale this is foramen spinosum this is foramen lacerum and this here is the depression for the trigeminal ganglion on the anterior as surface of the near the apex of the petrous part of temporal bone so what are the boundaries of posterior cranial fossa now posterior cranial fossa is bounded anteriorly by the same structures which are forming the anti the the posterior cranial fossa is bounded anteriorly by the same structures which are forming the posterior boundary of middle cranial fossa so what are those structures the superior surface of petrous part of temporal bone the posterior clinoid process and the tuberculum and the dorsum cella okay and then posteriorly the posterior cranial fossa is bounded by the squamous part of occipital bone so we have the dorsum cella posterior clinoid process the superior border of petrous part of temporal bone these are the anterior boundaries while the posterior boundary is the squamous part of occipital bone now important structures in the posterior cranial fossa this is called the this slope is called the clivus it actually gives support to the pons and medulla okay so pons and medulla are supported by the clivus and this is related to the basilar plexus yes and the basilar veins okay and then we have this largest foramen through which my finger is passing now of the skull which is known as foramen magnum magnum means large so it's the largest foramen foramen magnum then from the foramen magnum there extends a crest which is called internal occipital crest and this crest will pass to the prominence here which is called internal occipital protuberance this students lies opposite to the external occipital protuberance in norma occipitalis we did that this, this demarcates the head from the neck so we have got the foramen uh, magnum internal occipital crest internal occipital protuberance so these structures you must keep in mind then what are the other structures to look out for in the posterior cranial fossa near the center of the near the center of the uh, posterior surface of petrous part of temporal bone this is the internal acoustic meatus this transmits the 7th and 8th cranial nerves and then between the petrous temporal bone and occipital bone this is the jugular foramen so now the probe is in the jugular foramen through its middle part passes the 9th 10th and 11th cranial nerves and then students we find a for uh, the hypoglossal canal the internal opening of the hypoglossal canal so for that i am going to keep my thumb now on the occipital condyles and medial to it this opening which you see this is the internal opening of the hypoglossal canal you can appreciate here internal opening of the hypoglossal canal so it is just medial to the occipital condyle if i show it try to show it to you from this side then uh, i'll put my probe through the uh, this part now this is the hypoglossal canal can you make out students this is the hypoglossal canal so where does it lie it lies just it lies just medial to the okay i'll show you this way it lies just medial to the occipital condyle so this is the best view i think this is the hypoglossal canal and this is the occipital condyle okay so this is the internal opening of the hypoglossal canal through the hypoglossal canal the pelvic nerve is going to come out of the cranial cap so these are the important structures which you should know vis a vis the anterior cranial fossa middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa i hope they are clear to you if you see this video again and again i you pause it and you have a skull in your hand you have a book in front of you you will be able to 
put in your mind where these structures are actually located okay so they are important from the practical point of view yes now uh, i would like to uh, share with you some points regarding the cranial nerves the cranial nerves are so important yes so there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves the first cranial nerve is olfactory nerve second is optic okay now students olfactory optic and the eighth cranial nerve vestibular cochlea they are purely sensory nerves they are purely sensory nerves and ftgv that is facial trigeminal glossopharyngeal and vagus they are mixed cranial nerves so this this might sound simple but you know offhand if you ask a student name the cranial nerves which are mixed students sometimes they take long time or sometimes they are not able to answer and it doesn't look good in the examination so you should uh, always remember ftgv facial trigeminal glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves are the mixed cranial nerves 1 2 and 8 are sensory and whatever is left those are the motor cranial okay now the first cranial nerve is the smallest cranial nerve so it arises from the uh, receptors in the nasal mucosa and from there the nerve filaments are going to pass through this cribriform plate of ethmoid bone which is lying on either side of this crystal gali there are small openings in the cribriform plate and this olfactory nerve is going to come to the olfactory bulb and from the olfactory bulb the nerve fibers are going to be transmitted to the cortex through the olfactory tract so this is a sensory nerve okay so the, from the receptor the fibers are going to the brain similarly the optic nerve is a purely sensory nerve the optic nerve uh, you know it passes carries information from the retina to the brain yes so this optic nerve uh, leaves the orbit through the optic canal and I already showed you the position of the optic canal. So the optic nerve will leave the orbit and it will come towards, go towards the optic chiasma. Okay. So both the optic nerves will go towards the optic chiasma by passing through the optic canal. And then ultimately the uh, fibers for vision are going to go to the brain because this is a purely sensory nerve. Okay. The third cranial nerve cranial nerve is a motor nerve it is destined to supply the uh, eyeball muscles okay so what happens here is in the middle cranial fossa on either side of uh, this body of sphenoid bone there is the carotid sulcus i told you here lies the cavernous sinus now in its lateral wall lies the third nerve this third nerve in the anterior part of the lateral wall it divides into two divisions superior and inferior and these two divisions they enter the orbit through the uh, superior orbital fissure okay and the superior orbital fissure is lying here this is foramen rotundum and this is superior orbital fissure. now the probe is coming here through the superior orbital fissure so the third nerve its two divisions they leave the lateral wall of cavernous sinus and enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure so all extraocular muscles are supplied by third nerve except the superior oblique which is supplied by the fourth nerve and the lateral rectus by the sixth nerve the fourth nerve also lies in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus and it lies below the oculomotor nerve but in the anterior part of the lateral wall of cavernous sinus this fourth nerve crosses the third nerve and goes superior to it and it also enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure the fifth nerve lies below the fourth nerve in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus and this fifth nerve in the anterior part of the lateral wall divides into three divisions lacrimal frontal and nasociliary and these three also enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve now you see here i told you the location of the trigeminal ganglion here trigeminal ganglion here uh, near the uh, apex of the petrous part of temporal bone okay so there's a depression here and there lies the trigeminal ganglion from there the ophthalmic division is entering the lateral wall of cavernous sinus it divides into its three parts lacrimal frontal nasociliary and they enter the orbit through superior orbital fissure the maxillary division is going to enter the foramen rotundum it first lies in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus and then it enters the foramen rotundum 
it passes through it to go into the pterygopalatine fossa. The mandibular division of trigeminal nerve has got motor and sensory components. It enters the foramen oval. It enters the oval foramen or foramen oval and so it leaves the cranial. So, from the uh, impression for the trigeminal ganglion, ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular divisions of trigeminal nerve are arising. Ophthalmic is going to enter the orbit by dividing into its three branches through the superior orbital fissure. Maxillary is going to leave the cranial cavity through the foramen rotundum, while the mandibular is going to pass through the oval foramen, foramen oval to leave the cranial cavity. Okay. And the sixth cranial nerve, it supplies the lateral rectus. The sixth cranial nerve, we say, it passes through the center of cavernous sinus and it also enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. The seventh cranial nerve is the facial nerve. Seventh cranial nerve is the facial nerve and it's a mixed nerve. So, the seventh cranial nerve, it has got nuclei in the, seventh cranial nerve has got nuclei in the pons. And its motor and sensory components, both of them, they uh, come in relation to the internal acoustic natus. Okay, so this nerve arises from the pons, pons is resting on the clivus and from there, the seventh nerve and the eighth nerve, the seventh nerve with its motor and sensory component and the eighth nerve, they enter the internal acoustic matrix. Now, once inside the internal acoustic matrix, the seventh nerve, it passes through the facial canal and then it leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. I told you about stylomastoid foramen before, it lies between styloid process and mastoid process. This is styloid process, this is mastoid process and this is stylomastoid foramen. So, facial nerve enters the petrous part of temporal bone through the internal acoustic meatus, then it passes through the facial canal and then it comes out of the skull through the stylomastoid foramen as a purely motor nerve to supply the muscles of facial expression. The eighth nerve is again sensory and it rises from the pons and its fibers, they again enter the internal acoustic meatus. They enter the internal acoustic meatus and the actually the receptors for hearing and for balance they are located in the internal ear. So from there the eighth nerve fibers they come out and they pass through internal acoustic meatus because it's a purely sensory nerve and then these fibers they go up to the brain. Yes, so eighth nerve is a purely sensory nerve. So, it arises from the receptors for balance and receptors for hearing they are located in the internal ear and from there the fibers are going to come out uh, through the internal acoustic meatus and then they are going to go ultimately to the brain, okay. The nuclei are found in the pons. Then uh, uh, 9, 10th, 11th, 12th nerves, they arise from the medulla, okay. So, 9th, 10th and 11th, uh, 11th and 12th nerves are rising from the medulla. So, regarding the emergence of nerves, uh, I'll just take a break here. Regarding the emergence of nerves, the first two cranial nerves, they arise from the forebrain. Third and fourth cranial nerve, they arise from the midbrain. Fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth cranial nerves, they arise from pons. And 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th cranial nerves, they arise from medulla. Okay. So, the ninth cranial nerve is arising from the medulla. It's a mixed nerve. It's called glossopharyngeal nerve. So, it supplies a muscle. That muscle is stylopharyngeus and it is secretomotor to a salivary gland and that salivary gland is parotid gland. Yes, it is sensory and gustatory to posterior one third of tongue and it also supplies the soft palate and the fit. That is the ninth nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve. The 10th nerve students is the vagus, it's the longest nerve and the 10th nerve, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is a mixed nerve and this nerve, it uh, passes through the neck, thorax, abdomen and it supplies uh, these uh, organs which are derived from the foregut and the midgut, okay. And it is the main parasympathetic nerve of the body, the vagus. The Cranial root of accessory nerve, it is functionally, functionally considered to be a part of vagus because it joins the vagus. Yes, 
and so this is about the vagus nerve then the 11th nerve the spinal root of accessory nerve is considered truly as the 11th nerve because the cranial root i told you it's functionally a part of vagus so this spinal root of accessory nerve is a motor nerve it supplies the muscles uh, uh, two muscles trapezius and sternocleidomastoid uh, sternocleidomastoid helps in movement of the neck and this the trapezius muscle for the shrugging of the shoulders yes and the 12th cranial nerve is the hypoglossal nerve it is again a purely motor nerve it uh, supplies the intrinsic muscles of the tongue so this was about the uh, norma interior of norma basalis so in the examinations you know what happens is the examiner will put the probe in the foramen ovale and ask you okay student now what is this okay now you first of all see this is now the middle cranial fossa okay so is it a rounded foramen no rounded foramen is uh, here so this must be a foramen below that it's somewhat oval in shape yeah it seems like oval in shape and it has got a foramen posterior lateral to it so it should be foramen ovale okay so then you name name the structures passing through the foramen ovale so this is a kind of pass or fail question in the examinations yes so uh, you can't ignore it um, so uh, and you know to study the skull you need to have the skull with you if it is possible uh, uh, it may be a real skull it may be an artificial skull artificial skulls have got more prominent markings so if you have a skull with you and you keep on playing the video you keep on uh, reading through your books there is no doubt uh, you know slowly and slowly you will become very proficient and uh, you will you will be able to handle the tough examiners uh, on the d day yes and uh, your knowledge of uh, anatomy you know it improves when you know how the different nerves they leave the cranial cavity how they enter the cranial cavity which are the purely sensory purely motor cranial nerves and where are the cranial nerve nuclei located you know so all these things add to your concepts regarding anatomy and once you know them your confidence also increases and in head and neck students another important thing from an examination point of uh, view is what i called the mantras for the muscles you know all all muscles of this part are supplied by this nerve except this muscle which is supplied by the some other nerve so there are so many of these uh, uh, mantras which you have to if i if i may call them which you have to know so i'll be dealing with them in my next class and uh, thank you for your time and uh, do give me a feedback if possible because whatever i'm doing uh, uh, it may, it would make me feel good that uh, if it is beneficial for you in any way and uh, also uh, you know feedback always helps to improve so thank you once again for your time and uh, uh, if you have any queries, you can always uh, address them to me at anatomygaurav at the rate of yahoo.com and uh, my mobile number is 9815542792. If you have a query, you can WhatsApp it to me and uh, the reply may not be immediate, but uh, you will get a reply. Okay, so thank you so much for your time and till the next time we meet. Bye-bye and take care.